Chapter 1 Buzz, buzz, buzz. Angus groaned and hugged the pillow closer to him. Maybe if he pretended to be asleep, the noise would just go away. Buzz, buzz. It stopped. But there was someone hammering on the wall. Or, no, it seemed to be closer. It seemed to be coming from inside his head. Buzz, buzz, buzz. Angus groaned again, stretched out his arm, and pulled the ringing phone to his ear. Good morning, Angus, he heard Ross's voice say. Or should that be good afternoon? How are you feeling? I'm dying. Leave me alone, was Angus's mumbled reply. No, nah, that wouldn't be much fun. Ross sounded like he was enjoying himself. Angus turned over, wincing as the sunlight hit his eyes. What are you doing up so early? Why are you so cheerful? I'm not cheerful. It's just schadenfreude. And it's not early. It's one o'clock, and I've been up since eight. Some of us have real jobs, you know. Uh-huh, was Angus's response. So you had a good time last night, then. Susie and you seemed to be having a good chat when I left. Oh? The mention of Susie's name had finally woken Angus up. In fact, I was wondering if you know where she is. A body's been found, and everyone has to get to Arthur's seat now. Angus pulled himself into a sitting position and rubbed his eyes while he tried to understand the implications of Ross's question. It took a moment, but then he felt himself blush to his ears. No, no, I've no idea where she is, he protested. Wh why? Can you not get hold of her? No, she's not answering her phone, so I put two and two together. Ross still sounded amused, but became serious. But she really needs to come to work. The boss is not pleased. So if you hear from her... Of course, you said Arthur's seat and a body? That's right. I'm heading over there now. Okay, well, I hope you find Susie soon. Right, yeah. Bye. Angus sat a moment the phone quiet in his hand. A body on Arthur's seat. Now, that didn't happen every day of the week. Maybe he'd walk up there himself, see what was going on. He might see Susie, and some fresh air would help his sore head. But first things first, he needed a cup of tea. Thirty-five minutes later, Angus stumbled out of the front door of the Marchmont tenement he had lived in for a little over a year and began to walk in the direction of Newington. It was warmer than he had expected, and he was soon regretting the jacket he'd grabbed on his way out. He quickly forgot about that as he turned into Holyrood Park Road and saw the police vans parked at the end, sirens off, but blue lights flashing. He was surprised that they were still there, as he had taken a long time to get ready. It must be very serious. As he neared the entrance to Holyrood Park, he could see a police tape barrier strung across the road and pavement. A group of students from the nearby university accommodation were smoking and texting. A couple of joggers had also paused and were chatting to an elderly couple. Off to the side was a young woman. She stood out with her amazing fiery red hair, which was blowing across her face in the breeze. It contrasted perfectly with her green dress, and Angus was momentarily distracted by this vision. 
He quickly turned his attention, however, to the men and women on the other side of the plastic barrier. Police officers, forensic scientists, and other miscellaneous people who had a job to do at a crime scene. He caught sight of Ross standing near a van talking to his superior. Looking around, he saw Susie approach them. So Ross had managed to find her. He watched as she greeted Ross and their chief, who didn't look very pleased. He gestured towards the crowd of people, and Susie started walking in their direction. As he waited for her to cross the one hundred yards or so to where he and the others were standing, his attention was again diverted. This time to two paramedics carrying down a covered body and a police officer pulling at the lead of a dog. The animal, a border collie, was tugging at its restraint and barking quite fiercely. The uniformed officer was clearly having some trouble keeping the dog under control. Thank you, everyone. There's nothing to see here. Please be on your way and clear the area so that we can get on with our investigation. Susie seemed less than happy to have this task and stood with arms crossed as the collection of people moved off a few more yards. Job done, she turned to Angus. Afternoon? What are you doing here, then? The tone was neutral, but there was a hint of a smile on her face. Well, Ross woke me up, and so I thought I might as well come and have a look. Angus smiled and trailed to a halt. Um, so, how are you? Couldn't be better. Angus nodded at the sarcasm and asked, What happened here anyway? Now, Angus, you know I can't tell you anything. You'll just have to read about it in the paper. Besides, I'd better be getting on. See you later. Yes, fine. Uh, take care. Angus watched as Susie started to walk away. Behind her, he could see the struggling officer and dog, which was still pulling at its lead. Angus imagined it desperately trying to return to its master's side. The story of Greyfriars Bobby, the dog who wouldn't leave his master's grave, coming to mind. And at that moment, the collie finally broke free of the young officer and went tearing off. Dodging parked cars and outstretched arms before vanishing into the undergrowth. There were shouts and arm-waving from the police officers, but nothing more of interest to see. Angus turned his back on the scene and wondered what he should do now. It was a lovely day, and he was in no hurry to return to his messy flat. He'd go for a walk and clear the cobwebs. Removing the too warm jacket, he meandered off. With only one more glance at the action behind him, the mound of the crags and Arthur's seat bathed in the soft April sunlight. Chapter 2 Edinburgh had been Angus Fleming's home for eleven years now, but he hadn't lost the feeling of wonder at walking through its winding streets with their grey-yellow sandstone buildings, small gardens, and multitude of chimneys. He had arrived here as a naive eighteen-year-old, and the move from a small Hebridean island to this elegant and eerie city had been a shock to the system. In time, however, the streets, at least in the area around the university, had become as familiar to him as the paths he'd played on as a child growing up on Harris. Today he wasn't concentrating on the buildings, but was instead thinking about recent events. Nine months earlier, his first novel, 
a crime story had been published and had been an instant success. Pushing those thoughts to one side, he remembered how touched he was that his friends, Ross especially, had organized a party for him. He smiled to himself. Everyone had been so complimentary, and Susie in particular had looked at him differently. Or at least so it had seemed to him. He just hoped he hadn't made a fool of himself. The end of the evening was a bit of a blur. Sighing, he stopped to work out where he was. The runaway dog. Now, would it let him catch it? Angus stood, eyes fixed on the dog. The dog stared back. They both seemed to be thinking. Then Angus raised his eyebrows. He'd had a brainwave. The dog sat down, intrigued by Angus's actions. He had lifted up his jacket and was patting the pockets, muttering to himself. I'm sure it's still here. What did I do with it? Before smiling. Aha! He pulled out a crumpled crisp bag, opened it, and lay it flat on the ground, the flattened contents letting off an appetizing aroma of salt and vinegar. He took a step back and waited. Chapter 3 Walking back the way he had come, Angus could see police officers clustered around the police station on St. Leonard Street. Ross and Susie were there too. They spotted him with a dog, and a small group came to meet him a few steps away from the station. The dog started whining, then began barking again. How do you find her? We've been looking everywhere, asked a young officer, taking the lead from Angus. The dog pulled on it. Well, I was just walking through Dumby Dykes when I... Angus didn't get any further because everyone turned to watch as a car drew up. An elegant woman, her face set tight in disbelief, got out. Susie muttered, That must be the wife. Beside them the dog's barking grew louder, and it pulled at the lead. Taking the officer by surprise, it once again got free and ran in the direction of the woman. She turned and was greeted by outstretched paws, a wagging tail, and silence. Angus frowned slightly, but before he could articulate his thoughts, the quietness of the dog around somebody it knew, the others were patting him on the back, well done, Angus, and wandering off back to their duties, and him, you're well rid of, Chapter 4 Angus found the events of the day difficult to put out of his mind. Who was the murdered man? Was the girl with red hair connected to him? But until he saw Ross and Susie, he'd have to leave his questions unanswered. And even when he saw them, he knew there was little they'd be allowed to tell him. Instead, he decided to try and do some writing, get back into a routine after weeks of being on the road. But his heart wasn't in it, and he spent the following two days staring at a blank computer screen, pacing his flat, and trying to persuade his brain to cooperate. Angus tapped in, Great, see you at the pub, while he looked for his keys and jacket. All thought of Geoffrey Brodie suddenly forgotten. He was about to leave when he had a thought. Maybe Susie would be there. How's it going? Well, could be better. It's been mad at the station, as you can imagine. It's not been going well, though we think we've got a lead now. But all these people keep calling with information that turns out to be completely bogus. 
I can't say much, but, well, let's put it this way. Brody seems to have had some very shady friends. Something like that. Angus nodded. The germ of an idea had been planted, perhaps the start of a new story. His mind wandered as he sucked his pint and looked unseeingly at the familiar poster-covered walls of their favourite pub. His daydreaming was interrupted by Ross getting up to greet Susie, who had just walked in the door. Angus's heart began beating just that little bit faster. You made it, then. Angus is in a world of his own again, so I could use the company. Ross grinned. Same as usual? Susie just nodded as she sat down with a sigh. Hi, Susie. A uh, long, long day? Angus stammered. Mm, yeah, it's been non-stop. She did look tired, but Angus would never have let on he thought this. They were silent while they waited for Ross to return with her drink. Thanks, was her reply, when Ross brought over her G&T. Chapter 5 In the cold light of day, the story idea still seemed to have potential, but Angus knew he would need to do some research before he could start building on it. He jotted down a few notes, but quickly turned his attention to Google and Wikipedia, surfing for anything he could find on gallery owners, contemporary painting, and the Edinburgh art scene. As a child, he'd loved reading losing himself in new worlds which couldn't have been more different from the reality of his island life. He'd also written short stories and poems, but it was only when he started writing his first novel that he felt he'd finally found something he was good at. Nevertheless, the amount of research involved had surprised him but had also thankfully turned out to be a pleasant, if sometimes frustrating, task. At the moment, though, he could relax and enjoy it. Is this to do with Brody? Mm, yes, in a way. He's the spark for the whole thing. Why? Did you know him? Only by reputation. Catherine knows, knew him, and I've often heard her talk about him. From what I can gather, he was a terrible flirt with a penchant for young female artists. He'd offered them his support, and, as his gallery was successful, it was good to have him on your side. I don't know. There seem to have been several over the years. Can you use that for your story? Amy looked at him hopefully. Ah, uh, yes, possibly. It's still in the very early stages, and I'm not sure what direction it might take, so everything could be useful. Thanks. Not at all, she replied, satisfied. Glad I could help. But I've got to be getting back. Catch up again soon? Angus nodded and watched Amy as she walked back towards her work. He found his phone and called Ross. He repeated the gossip Amy had passed on, but Ross didn't seem that interested. We think we've got our man. Found a connection between Brody and a guy we've been watching for years. Deals in stolen art, but has never been convicted. He's been brought in for questioning. Chapter 6 As the sun burned through the morning har. Angus set off on foot in the direction of Stockbridge, the arty area of the new town. Brodie's gallery was located in Rayburn Terrace, the main street running through Stockbridge. It would be a fairly long walk, but a pleasant one, taking him through the old town and into the Georgian terraces of the new. With any luck, the mist would lift enough to allow a view over to Fife 
and the hills to the north of the city. Angus found walking helped the creative process. Today, though, he simply let his mind wander. It was too glorious a day to think about work. And in no time, it seemed, he'd arrived at the gallery. Brodie's written in chic silver lettering above the door. Slowly, he forced himself to focus. He'd tie himself in knots if he weren't careful, always imagining the worst. Calm again, he concentrated on what he was looking at. A landscape of a sunny beach, the sea gently lapping at the shore. Adopting the manner associated with people looking at paintings, he moved slowly and quietly around the room, head tilted slightly so as to better enjoy the pictures. As he walked past, he noticed that a door at the back of the gallery, probably to an office or a storeroom, was slightly ajar. However, he couldn't hear anything, so continued. Back at the front door, he started again, this time reading the captions and moving more randomly here and there. It didn't take long to realize the paintings were all by the same person, a woman called Katrina McFair. She also didn't look too happy to have a visitor. Well, hello, the paintings caught my eye, so I came in for a closer look. He stopped and waited for a reply. Mrs. Brody turned to look at the painting nearest them, a brief appearance of pain on her face. Is, is everything all right? You look... I'm sorry. Angus reached out a hand towards her. He suddenly felt very guilty for intruding on this woman's grief and misfortune. He was ashamed of letting his curiosity get the better of him, but didn't know how to put it right. She had now completely turned away from him, her hands held up to cover her face, clearly trying not to cry. Chapter 7 Shortly after, they were sitting opposite each other, cups of tea on the table. Mrs. Brodie had recomposed herself. Angus introduced himself. I'm Angus. Eleanor Brody. No, I didn't. Well, that's no great loss, she sounded bitter. He's gone, and now I have to clear up his mess. It appears the successful gallery owner wasn't so canny after all. Seems he wasn't just cheating on me. Angus raised his eyebrows slightly, but didn't say anything. Mrs. Brodie didn't appear to notice. I thought Geoffrey had saved, but it turns out he owes thousands of pounds. And to whom? Some thug? God, I don't know what I'm going to do. The muscles in her jaw tightened as she said this. She glanced at him quickly before continuing... I don't know why I'm telling you this. I don't even know you. She stiffened a moment, her gaze once more directed at him. You're not from the press, are you? You look familiar. No, not exactly. I'm not sure. Angus took a deep breath. I'm not explaining myself very well, I'm sorry. I'm... I'm here because I'm nosy. I really am. Sorry. It was very thoughtless of me. The story is just a vague idea at the moment. I don't know how it'll turn out, what it'll be about. Mrs. Brodie didn't answer, and Angus wondered how he could make the situation better. Chapter 8 Back at his flat, Jessie exploring her temporary home... Angus thought back over the afternoon. It occurred to him that he should check if it was okay for him to have the dog, seeing as it was involved in a police investigation. And he wanted to fill Ross in anyway, 
so he dialed his number. Ross sounded angry and began talking before Angus could really speak. Are you sure? Not yet, but she had a motive and knew where her husband was going. We just need to establish her whereabouts more exactly at the time of the murder. Why? Angus told Ross about his meeting with Eleanor Brodie, ending with his question about Jesse. Chapter 9 Angus had a restless night. He couldn't stop thinking about the case. What had started as a bit of harmless nosiness, just research for a story, had turned into something more serious. He'd had tea with a suspected murderer and was looking after her dog. He knew he should disentangle himself, but was finding the whole situation quite thrilling. It was a puzzle, and he liked puzzles. Though he didn't have access to all the information the police did, he still wanted to solve the mystery of the red-haired girl, even if it was only for his own satisfaction. He struggled with his conscience telling him to leave well alone, and only finally fell asleep, having decided to put off the decision until the morning. It was another sunny day. White clouds dotted the blue sky as Angus got up and went to get showered. With the water beating down on him, he reached a decision. He'd stop meddling in the case. He had wanted to relax after all his PR stuff, and that was what he'd do. No more research and asking questions. With the decision made, he hurried to get dressed. He wanted to be outside and making the most of the lovely weather. He had a quick breakfast and then left the flat, Jesse following behind him. It felt a bit tactless to take her to Arthur's seat, so the meadows would have to do for a morning walk. With one of the many paperbacks beside his bed stuffed into his pocket, in this case one that Susie had recommended, they set off along the quiet street. The park looked lovely in the early morning light. The cherry trees which lined Middle Meadow Walk had only just blossomed, and a glorious haze of pink set against sharp green leaves and the blue sky created a gorgeous canopy over his head. He turned off the path in the direction of the tennis courts. Arriving at the triangle of grass at the east end of the park, he let Jessie off her lead and found a stick to throw to her. She brought it back so obediently to him that he sat down on a bench and started to read his book, only looking up when she reappeared. Time passed, and he was so absorbed in the novel, everything to do with the case forgotten, that he didn't immediately notice that Jessie hadn't come back. When he did, he stood up to get a better look, but couldn't see her. Panic mounted as he pictured her running out into the road behind him. He rushed towards the center of the grass, hoping to see around the hedge that bordered the tennis courts, while also looking over his shoulder for any signs of a black and white shape on the road. With a sigh of relief, he spotted her wagging tail after only a few steps. He found her being petted by a red-headed girl he recognized at once. It was the girl from Arthur's seat, and possibly, if he was right, the artist in Brody's gallery. Why do you want to know? Angus took that as a yes. I saw you at Arthur's seat when they found... when they brought down the body. The girl didn't react, so Angus continued. He was, or still is, exhibiting your paintings. So you must have known him, and I think you knew him very well. Is that right? 
Who are you? What has this got to do with you? Nothing. It's got nothing to do with me, Angus admitted. I was just intrigued. He was aware of how lame this sounded and waited for her reply. She looked him up and down and must have decided he looked harmless as her posture relaxed a little. Yes, I knew him, knew him well. She touched her rounded stomach, and her look confirmed what Angus had suspected. Brody was the father. Chapter 10 He heard nothing from Ross or Susie for a few days, and didn't want to bother them by calling. He had to make do with the newspaper, and whatever they printed, but besides learning more about Brody in his obituary, there was very little new information. He tidied his flat, walked Jessie, and spent as much time outside as he could. Yes, we're celebrating, or rather recovering from the whole thing. So, are you going to come or not? I haven't seen you for a few days. Angus's smile widened at her use of the first-person singular and assured her that he was on his way. Was it Eleanor Brodie? Yup. But you'll have to wait for the papers to find out more. Now get a move on. Your beer won't wait forever. Angus laughed and hurried off towards the pub and his friends. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.